I can't hear me. Now I can. Now I can. Awesome. Hey, real quick. Are you guys glad that God is on his throne? Yes. Right? All the time. I, listen, I'll tell you, I, I'm just going to confess, pastorally, from week to week, there, there is so much that goes on in contemporary culture that uh, I always feel pressured to address. And there's, there's drama all over the world. And so let me just begin by reminding you of these two things. One, he is on his throne, okay? As Chad reminded us, the gospel is going to the ends of the earth, and his kingdom will not be thwarted, okay? Will not be thwarted. He will come back one day at his appointed time, and the sky will split apart like a scroll, and all will behold him. Amen? Now catch this, and secondly, the moment you and I want to get offended by culture, and I get angry and my blood boils, remember this, that while they were mocking him on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I get offended and you get offended, but he is unlike any other God. Unlike any other God. All right, with that, drink that in your heart. All right, with that, turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 43. We're going to continue our walk through our summer sermon series on the life of Joseph. If you do not have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. You can have a copy of God's Word. Keep that as your own. Mark in it. Read it. Put notes in the side. Did you know it's okay to mark up God's Word? I mark it up so much I just get a, get a new Bible and start all over the next time, all right? All right, you hold your spot in Genesis 43. I'm going to start in verse 11 here in a moment. But first, I need you to imagine with me that someone gifts the family one of those assorted box of chocolates, okay? Okay, one of those, a big box that has the list on the inside cover of everything that's there. And this is the kid's favorite, right? Can I have the one with coconut in it? You pass it out as a family, and after everyone has a go-round, of course, they beg for one more. Can we have just one more, Dad? Yeah, all right, one more each. After that, the box is half gone. But you say to the entire family, you know what, here's what we're going to do. This is the family's box of chocolate. We're going to leave this here for tomorrow night. No one is to touch the chocolate until we come back together tomorrow night. Does everyone understand? Oh, yeah, of course. And we get to come back tomorrow night, and we'll do this again. Well, guess what? You come back the next night, and the box is almost empty. Which one of you kids ate the missing chocolate? Not me. I didn't do it. I wasn't even here most of the day. And one by one, they all deny it. Everyone take a step closer. And you notice in the corner of the youngest one's mouth, a smudge of chocolate. Johnny, did you eat the chocolate? No, Dad. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. But Johnny, there's chocolate on your face. Um, that was from yesterday. <laughs> Johnny, when I tucked you into bed, I washed your face. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. The devil made me do it. It wasn't my fault. Just please, I'm sorry. Question. Why is Johnny suddenly so repentant? And more importantly, is this the kind of repentance that Jesus requires 
for salvation. Remember when he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is the first word of the gospel. Remember when Peter preached his sermon in Acts chapter 2? After the Holy Spirit had come down and he addresses the crowd and they say, what must we do? And he says, repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Genuine salvation, repentance. Repentance that leads to salvation. We're going to talk about the counterfeit version that each of us must examine ourselves. So as we pick up our story in the life of Joseph today, we're actually going to be focusing on Judah and this idea of genuine repentance, repentance that leads to eternal life. Listen as I read in Genesis 43, starting in verse 11. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bag and carry down to the man as a present, a little balm and a little honey, uh, aromatic gum and uh, myrrh and pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand uh, the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and arise, return to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man, so that he will release to you your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, I am bereaved. If I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present, they took double the money in their hand and Benjamin, and then they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning, as we come to your word, as we think well and critically about this idea of repentance, Father, I pray everyone under the sound of my voice knows what genuine, true repentance looks like and is in the depth of our heart, the repentance that leads to salvation. Father, we do confess as a people, we are are so quick to gloss over this step of genuine repentance and to confuse it with, with mere emotions or sorrow for the moment or just sorry that we got caught. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work that only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So recall where we are in our story. In the very beginning, Joseph is one of 12 brothers, and he got dreams, revelation from the Lord that one day, 11 of his brothers would all bow down to him. He told his brothers those dreams, and out of jealousy, they sold him into slavery, into captivity. Uh, Joseph spent 13 years in captivity before... He is released because he can interpret dreams for Pharaoh. He interprets Pharaoh's dreams that there would be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Famine so bad that you will forget the first seven years. Joseph is released out of slavery and he's exalted to the number two in the whole land of Egypt. He's given the the ability to to be the mastermind of storing up all the agriculture and and dispensing it as as a businessman who is a leader who's equipped to do all of those things. And we know that God has pushed the story forward because uh, the brothers there in Israel also endure the famine. The famine is so widespread that they have to come to Egypt to buy grain. Joseph recognizes them but they don't recognize Joseph. They think Joseph is dead. Joseph recognizes them and puts them to a test. Now, as we walk through the summer sermon series, we talked a lot about forgiveness. 
And forgiveness, the first step of really what we identified as enemy love, what God requires of you, is a vertical step. It is something that you can do, just you and God. It is not dependent upon their response. And that is that you can love your enemy by getting off the throne and trusting that God alone is the one to judge and deal with them. That has taken place in Joseph's life. Okay, But that second step, what we would call reconciliation, requires repentance by the other person, requires a response for them. And so Joseph is right to test his brothers. Remember, there's a difference between love your enemy and reconciliation and trust. All of those are in different categories. And I'm trying to give us helpful handles as we walk through this because we apply this to our own lives, right? So here we are. Joseph has put his brothers to a test because when the brothers showed up, Benjamin didn't come because Benjamin is still father's favorite. And so Joseph says, do not return. He accuses them of being spies on the land. Do not return unless you bring Benjamin. So they go back And of course, Jacob sticks his head in the sand. He refuses. He actually says to them, listen, Joseph is already dead and Benjamin is my only son left. I mean, what a dagger in the heart. That could have sent the brothers into where we were last week. Is that a stone that they're going to continue to stumble over? Judah could have stumbled over that stone. If you will recall, Judah is the one who sold Joseph for money into slavery. And his life has been an absolute mess. Absolute mess. He marries foreign wives who have other religions. His sons are so evil uh, that God strikes them dead. But what we saw last week was a stark change in Judah. That is, Judah offered himself as surety for Benjamin. He said, let me bear the blame before you forever. And so we should be asking the question, is this a sign that Judah has genuinely repented? All 11 brothers leave to return back to Egypt. They are full of nervous guilt. It is kind of hung above them like a cloud, a dark cloud, All six months while Simeon continued to sit in captivity, (coughs) the brothers have recognized the parallels of this situation and their previous betrayal of Joseph. Recall with me what they said back in chapter 42. They said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother. They mean Joseph. Because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy? And you would not listen. They're bickering back and forth. And now comes the reckoning for his blood. That night, Asher wakes up in a cold sweat and he taps Dan on the shoulder and says, I dreamed about Joseph again. Me too, says Dan. No one feels good about the journey back to Egypt. They all have the premonition that it is an ambush, yet they are forced to go for their own survival because of the famine. They know and they feel the heavy hand of God upon them, that God has forced the issue. But we should pause and ask, Yeah, they're full of sorrow and emotion, but are they simply sorry that they got caught or have they come to genuine repentance? Let me talk to us this morning for a moment about genuine, true repentance and counterfeit emotions. Now, certainly there is a right place for emotions in true repentance, But it's very important for us to not equate emotions as genuine repentance. 
There's no right amount of crying or guilt or sorrow. That's a recipe. All right, now you've cried enough. I guess you're truly repentant. Do not be fooled. And do not fool yourself. In fact, there is no external recipe for repentance. It is a matter of the heart. Because the question is always, why? Why are you full of sorrow? Is it because you got caught? Is it because the consequences are severe? Is it because you are ashamed that your reputation has taken a hit and you so desire other people's approval? Or is it because you know that sin breaks fellowship with God and you long to be made right with Him? Recall the example of the chocolate at the beginning. Johnny was clearly only sorry that he got caught. It was self-preservation, including the part where he changed his tune to all sorries after he had no out. Because even a kid knows that the way to save yourself when you have no outs is to plead mercy from the judge. But let me ask you, did his heart worry that he had Uh, broken the trust of the Father? No. He kept lying right to his face. You see, in reality, true repentance and self-preservation are mortal enemies. True repentance is not selective. It doesn't wait till you get caught. It fully exposes the sin, even the unknown parts, right? It's not good enough to confess only what others have found out. It doesn't try and skirt the consequences. True repentance actually wants to get to the root of sin, not just skim the surface. You know when you have uh, grass growing in the, the flower bed and there's that temptation because your wife's told you to go clean out the flower bed and just take that weed eater and just skim the surface. Does that do any good? Absolutely not, right? That's worthless. You see, true repentance is pulling out the root because this alone will do. Verse 16, when Joseph saw Benjamin there with them, By the way, this is in chapter 44. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, bring the men into the house and slay an animal (coughs) and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. The brothers are actually escorted to Joseph's personal house and they get to dine and have lunch with the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. Now, everything about this lunch is meant to be a blessing. Yet the situation only amplifies the brothers' fears. Verse 18, now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we are being brought in that they may seek an occasion against us and may fall upon us <coughs> and take us for slaves with our donkeys. They think it's an ambush. They think that they are going to be attacked and taken as slaves. You know, the guilt of what they did to Joseph continues to loom. They are actually afraid that they will get what they deserve. You see, true justice is a haunting concept. They function in the paranoia of the guilty. They're overly suspicious of others, right? They are projecting their own darkened hearts onto others. Thou dost protest too much. Nervously, the brothers find the head steward of the house. 
Now, he happens to speak Hebrew. And they begin to explain that, well, the money was in their sacks, and and they didn't know how it got there, and they've brought it back. But the head steward says, be at ease. The Hebrew word there is shalom. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And then he brought out Simeon to them. Now this has to hit them like a two by four between the eyes. The Egyptian reminding them that God is moving. God is on his throne. God is going before them. God is providing for them. It's also an amazing testimony of Joseph's influence here in Egypt. And Simeon has been released. And all 11 of the brothers are now there when Joseph arrives. Verse 26, when Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him uh, the present which was in their hand and bowed to the ground before him. You know that dream? That was some 20, 25 years prior. That has now been fulfilled. This was the very moment that God ordained. Now, we will come back to this in more detail next week because we're going to comb through the same scenes but look at through the lens of Joseph. For today, we're combing through and looking at it from Judah's perspective and focusing on this idea of genuine repentance. Now, what we need to know from the scene is that they share a huge meal together. Joseph is at his own table by himself, and his table is filled with all sorts of decadent foods. Now, the Egyptians didn't eat with, uh, with outsiders at all. It made them ritually unclean. So the brothers are seated at their own table in the same giant banquet hall. They have a seating arrangement that's given. And it's all done in order based on age. Now this <coughs> freaks the brothers out. They're uh, already nervous the whole time. And then they go to sit down and they're like, this guy knows all of our ages and has seated us in order. And their mind is blown. It only makes them that much more nervous. And then Joseph takes food from his own table and he himself serves each of the brothers. But when he gets to Benjamin, he gives Benjamin five times as much as the others. Now, by the way, as you picture this in your mind, Benjamin is in his late 20s, okay? The fact that Joseph gives Benjamin five times as much is a very important detail because Joseph is intentionally showing dad's favorite even more favoritism. Does this infuriate the brothers as it did with him? So they feast and they drink and they have a phenomenal time. And in the morning, they leave. And Joseph has their sacks filled with grain. He has their, all their money returned. But on top of that, he has his head servant place his silver cup in Benjamin's sack. The brothers don't know that that's there. The brothers are now reunited, reunited with Simeon. And they're all going home. All 11 of them, with Simeon, with Benjamin. And for the first time in a long time, they feel like that cloud has finally been lifted. Can you imagine their relief as they leave Egypt? Especially Judah. Their step is lighter. 
Gad hugs Simeon. They have a laugh. I bet you thought we were just going to leave you there. It's moments. <laughs> the moment, though, is about to enter into the final test that is about to be sprung. Because as the brothers get just outside of the city, Joseph's head steward races up upon them in his chariot. Why have you returned all the goodness that we bestowed upon you with evil? One of you has stolen my Lord's silver cup. The brothers reply, your servants would never do that. Remember, we brought the money back to you. Verse 8 says, how then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? The brothers say, with whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we will also be <coughs> my Lord's slaves. So he said, now let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave. <coughs> but the rest of you shall be innocent. Obviously, the head servant has been coached exactly what to do by Joseph. And so the house steward, <coughs> excuse me, searches each of their bags, beginning with the oldest and moving to the youngest. And behold, the silver cup is found in Benjamin's bag. You see, Joseph's final test of repentance is actually brilliant. You see, they came back for Simeon, but remember, they kind of had to. There was a famine in the land, and they had to eat for their survival. <coughs> Here is the real test. Will they betray their father's favorite son? When given a chance, will they do to Benjamin what they did to him? Or have they repented? And will they do everything in their power to make right the wrong that they have caused? They have felt the heavy hand of God that has begun to awaken their muted consciences. What will they do? Verse 13, then they tore their clothes and each man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, Joseph was still there. And he fell to the ground, they fell to the ground before him. And Joseph said to them, what is this deed that you have done? Now, I want you to notice that all of them <coughs> return to fight for Benjamin. Instead of running away, Instead of running away and saving themselves, they put themselves in harm's way. And when they get there back before Joseph, Judah steps forward. Listen to what he says. What can we say to you, my Lord? And what can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one whose possession the cup has been found. So Judah now speaks for all the brothers. And as I've been highlighting along the way, they've sensed that this entire situation has been a reckoning for their past sins. I believe we hear that in Judas's response. That this is finally a chance to come clean. No excuses. No justification. Full consequences. We are all my Lord's slaves. They do not betray Benjamin. In fact, they enter into punishment with him. So let's go back and let's think for a moment about true repentance. Let me talk to your heart. True repentance 
is to understand that your sin is first a betrayal against God himself. Like an adulterer who finds his satisfaction in another. We are so prone to view sin as a failure in action, as if it was just a simple misstep, rather than a failure of intimacy. We are disappointed in ourselves, not that we have despised the living God. You know, genuine repentance does require godly grief or what the scripture calls a broken, contrite spirit. Listen to Joel chapter 2, 12 and 13. God speaking to his people says, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart not your garments. You know that picture of when Old Testament saints, here, the brothers, they're so distraught over the situation that they tear their clothes? Well, you know what God says here? I don't want you to tear your clothes. I want you to tear your heart with contrition as you come back to me. Now, let me remind you, beloved, that this is a gift of God. This is a work of the Spirit alone. You cannot produce it yourself. And yet it is still required of you. You must seek it. You must seek it. Repentance is turning to God with your whole heart. But let me also state the practical and obvious, that one cannot turn towards God and not also turn away from sin. To turn towards God is to turn away from sin. So a rich man was hiring a chauffeur to be his driver, and he asked the applicants a question, How close to the edge can you drive and keep me safe? Well, the first one was very confident in his abilities, and he said, listen, I can get all the way up to the edge and keep you safe. The second one boastly uh, expounded, right, with pride. He said, listen, I can get half of my tire over the edge and keep you safe. And the third applicant replied, Sir, I will hug the inside edge and keep you as far away from the cliff as possible. Which driver do you think he hired? Listen, to repent is to turn away from sin, to pull up the root. And to turn to God as your all in all. (laughs) Lastly, I would point out that repentance certainly includes a longing to right the wrong. That's what the brothers show us here. They have a willingness to right the wrong. No excuses No justification, full consequences. They will not betray Benjamin, and instead they enter into punishment with him. Well, in verse 17, Joseph denies their request (coughs) that they all be made slaves. He says, that wouldn't be fair, I wouldn't be just, and so only Benjamin will be a slave, for he is the one who stole the cup. And the rest of you, can go in peace back to your father. Masterly, right? Joseph has filled the scene with ultimate tension. And now comes one of the most moving, Christ-like moments in the entire Old Testament. 
Because Judah steps forward again and now asks to speak to Joseph personally and privately. As he talks to Joseph here, he recaps the journey, kind of from beginning to where we are. I'm going to highlight some of those most important details. He has to explain to Joseph, as if Joseph doesn't know anything at all about the situation, about what it's like back at home. So in verse 18, he says, can I speak to you in private? Please do not be angry. In verse 20, he reminds him of the first time they talked to him. We said to my Lord that we have an old father and a little child of his old age. Now his brother is dead, so he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. And then Jacob tells, uh, sorry, Judah tells Jacob's reply. Once they went back with the situation, once they went back and said, listen, the guy said we have to bring Benjamin. This was Jacob's reply. My father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. Think of that statement. Think about how that cuts. And one went out from me and said, surely he is torn into pieces and I have not seen him since. And if you take this one also from me and harm befalls him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. So Judah is recapping Jacob's response. Now Judah addresses Joseph personally. He says, now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life. Think about how hard this must be for Judah to make these statements about his father. My father's life is bound up in his favorite son. Judah is unfolding all the dysfunction and the hurt of his family. All is not as it should be. He fully acknowledges, right, that we've always been second rate in dad's eyes. We've never been enough. But I want you to notice here that Judah doesn't play the victim. He says it in the most positive way possible. My father's life is bound up in Benjamin alone. And now listen to what Judah does next. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord. Judah says, please let me become a slave instead of Benjamin. And let the lad go with his brothers. For how shall I go to my father if the lad is not with me? For fear that I will see the evil that would overtake my father. Judah lays down his life in exchange for his brother Benjamin. How? How can he do that? How is he able to put everyone else first? No longer a anger over the rejection of his father. How can he do that? Because the love of Christ has healed him. This is a work of the Holy Spirit alone. Friend, I beg that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Remember last week when we walked through this and I explained that when all is not as it should be, Jacob should be a good father, but he's not. The brothers long for Jacob to accept them, say that they are enough, 
That's why they were so furious and so angry. That's why they sinned against Joseph all those years prior. But last week, I told you, you must take that hurt, that void, where all is not as it should be, and allow God alone to fill you. Allow God alone, through His Son, through His Holy Spirit, to fill you when it's not as it should be. Guys, that is where Judah is. That is what we're seeing. That's why this is one of the most magnificent, selfless acts (coughs) of sacrificial love in the entire Bible. What a pointer to Jesus Christ. Here is Judah. Judah has genuine repentance. He has the repentance that leads to eternal life. And I want you to notice that in this moment, as Judah bows before Joseph and says, take me as a slave, that for the first time, Judah is free. He's free of the bondage of his soul. He's genuinely repented before God, and he is free. And so my question, as we close, is what about you? What about you? Have you found the freedom that's only found in repentance at the foot of the cross? Have you genuinely repented of your sins? That is, that you've allowed the Holy Spirit to convict you such that you know your sin is an offense to God. Not are you sorry you got caught? Are you sorry your reputation has been spoiled? But as the Spirit of God showed you that your sin breaks fellowship with God Almighty, has your heart been torn such that you would long to be made right with Him? Genuine repentance. Can I tell you what you find? When you come to the almighty, holy God with genuine repentance, can I tell you what you find? That he has given his son for you and that he delights to wash you white as snow. He delights to make you whole again. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. I can't believe I forgot the very ending of that. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Friend, I pray that you know, that you know, that you have eternal life today that is only found in true repentance at the foot of the cross. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit that brings us to true conviction of our sin. Conviction that does not skirt consequences, that acknowledges the fullness of it. 
That is a work of your Holy Spirit to allow us to see clearly that we have offended you, a holy God. But that you have provided the one and only way of escape by kneeling at the foot of the cross, finding all of our hope, all of our trust in the finished work of Jesus. Finding grace and mercy for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, if there is anyone here this morning that has not genuinely repented, Father, I pray that you would do what only you can do and open our hearts, cleanse them white as snow. And Father, I pray for us as Christians who so often know the truth but we harbor sin in corners of our lives. We pretend like that sin is not nearly as evil as it is. We hide it. We get so used to it, so comfortable with it. Father, I pray right now with the work of your spirit that we would rend our hearts that we would weep and we would fast and we would do everything to come back into fellowship with you that your spirit would remind us that every sin even as a believer separates fellowship from you and that we need to continually come to the foot of the cross In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in one final song, we are invited to respond. I would remind us, I would remind us that the greatest movements in all of history have always been centered around prayer and genuine repentance by the people of God, by the people of God getting serious about our sin, coming before him and weeping over it. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you, have a word of comfort with you. If you want to use these steps or the stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord. However, the spirit of God has pressed upon you this morning. I pray that you would be obedient. Would you stand?